Your retirement savings are in jeopardy. The banks and Wall Street firms are looking out only for themselves. The markets are confusing and treacherous to navigate without help. The number one financial question is, am I going to run out of money in retirement? Paul Merriman is here to help. Imagine putting your head on the pillow at night without worrying about your bills. Paul Merriman is an educator, award-winning podcaster, and best-selling author whose straightforward advice about retirement savings and managing money has been followed by tens of thousands of people. You have the chance to double or even triple your returns over a lifetime. And the sooner you start, the better off you are. Learn about his five life-changing choices to help you grow and manage your money in financial fitness after 50. When you follow my plan, you will have more money with less risk. And best of all, more peace of mind. Here's Paul Merriman. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Paul Merriman, and in this presentation, I want to discuss one of the most important topics, one of the most important lists that I've ever put together. And this list is for retirees. It's about how to avoid the 20, 20 most common money management mistakes retirees make. And the reason I think this is important is because once we get to this moment of leaving work, leaving that weekly or bi-weekly check, leaving all of those who care about us and help us keep our lives together, we're all of a sudden, we're on our own, at least on our own financially. Nobody to give us that, that weekly check. So now we got to make sure we don't make any big mistakes. So as I walk through these 20, my hope is that you'll look at your situation and ask yourself, is this a mistake that I might be making and correct it? Number one, for example, not having a plan. Oh, this is huge. Because if you have a plan, then you have the ability to look at your personal situation carefully. You can spot any areas of weakness. You can get it down on paper. And once you get it down on paper, then you can show it to somebody else who might be able to discuss that with you. They, they might be able to critique it with you. They might see a hole that you've left because they've got more experience in this whole process of planning. Because this is all going to happen. It's going to happen by design or by default. And we want everything that goes on in your financial life from now on to be by design. And I have found that once you have a plan, it is possible for a couple to get together to make some decisions that if they don't get that on paper, they don't address some of the hard topics. Now, number two, I want you to make sure that you don't take too much risk. Remember that we can't make up a bad investment. You make a decision that costs you a lot of money, then you're kind of behind the eight ball, then what do you do? Do you take extra risk to kind of catch up? Or do you withdraw and not take any risk at all and then not having enough of a return? So be careful that you haven't committed to too much risk. And people think in terms of stocks. They always think in terms of stocks and risk. And yet if you look at fixed income investments, many of those historically, those that have been the easiest to sell have been the worst for investors. Now, Ponzi schemes aren't necessarily the easiest to sell, but if you look at most Ponzi scheme deals, they're fixed income deals. In 1990, high yield bonds were, were earning 16%, 16%. And people, they, they, they would say, why should I put money in the market? Well, I can get 16%, but then those bonds went down 40% many of them. In fact, some of them actually went away. And I look back at the late 90s when a lot of retirees had a significant amount of their money in that NASDAQ market, the technology stocks. Yeah, they were doing great in the late 90s. Uh, great enough that it enticed a lot of people 
to overcommit to risk, and then all of a sudden, they were really behind the eight ball. Money Magazine, as much as I think that it's filled with lots of good information, I think those kinds of magazines enticed a lot of people thinking, into thinking that that kind of investment was right for them. So taking too much risk can really set you back. But then the other side of that coin is taking too little risk. Having all of your money in fixed income. You take too little risk and you run the risk of not having enough income as inflation heats up. And we've been predicting our industry has for two or three years that inflation is about to heat up and interest rates are about to go up and that those fixed income instruments that you've got today will actually go down in value. And during those periods where interest rates tend to heat up and, and, get, and, and move higher, those are periods that stocks often move higher. So putting too much in fixed income can actually hurt you rather than help you. And of course, if you just put a little bit, you don't have to put a lot, maybe put 10 or 20% into the equity part of your portfolio, that is likely enough to get you over the hump to make up for that increase in inflation as, as uh, the, the markets go up over time and those fixed income instruments aren't able to keep up. Number four, assuming your cost of living is going to go down after retirement. Half of the people, half of the people who retire actually spend more after they retire than they did before they retired. Now, yes, there are lots of experts who, who will say, you can live on 40% of what you did when you were still working. You can live on 80%. But a lot of people in those early years, in fact, spend more. There, there's an increase in the cost of travel. They've got to remodel their homes they've been waiting for years to do. There are medical costs, often moving costs, but it can actually cost you more and you should plan for that in those early years of retirement. Number five, you take too much out of your portfolio. One of my favorite articles, How Much Can You Prudently Take Out of Your Investments in Retirement? I wrote that many years ago and I regularly update it. And what I see is that if you're able to live on 4%, aggressively 5%, you're probably okay. But guess what? 30% of retirees are taking out 7% or more. That is extremely aggressive, and from all of the studies I've seen, unless you have a relatively short expected lifespan, you are probably going to get yourself into trouble. Each one of us, we have to look at our health, our genetic makeup from what we know of our family, and of course, if we are married, if we are healthy, if we are 65, there's a 25% chance that one of the couple will be alive at age 97. There's a 50% chance that one of us will still be alive at 92. So this money has got to last a lifetime. And Bud Hebler, who uh, runs a website, uh, AnalyzeNow.com, he says that people forget the O-S-I-F factor in budgeting for retirement. It's the, oh shoot, I forgot. It's the replacing of the roof. It, a number of the costs that come along, replacing things over time that people forget to include in their budget. Number six, not taking tax-efficient distributions from your retirement investments. You know, normally we would say to always use your taxable money first. Leave that tax deferred money alone. Let it grow and grow before you take it out. Because when you take the taxable money first, you may pay little or in some cases, no taxes. I have met a lot of people who decided because they weren't sure 
They would do 50-50. They would take tax out, half out of the taxable, half out of their uh, tax deferred, thinking, well, that was kind of a balanced approach to uh, being tax efficient. But that is not the right approach. You should try to use that taxable money first, leave the tax deferred to, to, to grow as long as it possibly can. Number seven, taking Social Security too early. You know, two-thirds of the people who take Social Security take it early. They want to get their hands on that money as soon as possible. And yes, in a lot of cases, that is the right thing to do. Obviously, it's the right thing to do if you don't have enough money, income, from your pension in order to retire. Or if that's the only way you can retire early, then you have to take it. But if you are going to live a long time, remember that every year you put off taking that Social Security up until you're age 70, there's an 8% bonus. And that's, 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 that's an automatic guaranteed increase. So I think that if you're not sure, you ought to sit with an advisor, have them look at your financial situation and see if it's worthwhile to get that guarantee to wait a few years before you tap into your Social Security. And remember, as lo the longer you wait, the more that your surviving spouse is going to get if you predecease the spouse. And number eight, a lot of people take their pension in cash. Now, I know that the HR departments uh, warn people they shouldn't do this, but we still see this happen. People reach retirement, they want to roll that money over into an IRA, so they have the pension paid to them. And guess what happens? Uncle Sam says, thank you very much. We'll take 20% of that. So the check that you get will be 80% of the pension. Now, eventually, you'll get that back because what you're going to do is you're going to roll that check over to a custodian and get that into an IRA. But in the process of letting the company and hold out that 20% and pay that to the government, you now have to come up at this point with that 20% out of pocket. And if you don't have that 20% out of pocket, you may not get that entire pension rolled over in time and you will have missed the opportunity to take advantage of that tax-free rollover. Number nine, underestimating the life expectancy. Money generally has to work a lot longer than people expect. It happens because health care advances and how much money we have both seem to impact the, the life expectancy. The richer you are, the longer we live, generally. I'm 68. My life expectancy is 85. And people think, well, I'm going to live to be 85. Well, not in my case, because I know that that average means that half of the people live longer than 85. That money needs to, to last beyond 85. In my case, I would like to think it would be 90, maybe 95. But the key here is to make sure in your plan you have prepared to have that money last more than just the average life expectancy. Most planners will say you should plan on living to 100. Number 10, one of the most costly decisions that I've seen investors make who are in retirement is they'll have a decent balance of stocks and bonds. And they know they're not going back to work. And so when that stock market heads down, even if they've got part of the portfolio in bonds, they have a tendency to want to go someplace where it's very, very safe. 
They want to, they, 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 they know, yes, they know that the market always recovers. They've heard that. But how do you know it's going to recover this time, they'll ask. How do we know that history will be different? Does history tell us necessarily about the future? They have all these reasons that they want to get out and find a safe, safe place. So if you are going to be the type that might have a tendency to jump, I want you to go to a little more fixed income. I want you to go to a little more fixed income than you probably would when you're feeling good about the market. Because we've got to make sure that you don't get into that, into that mode of jumping ship at the very moment the market is close to or at the bottom. And if you do that, if you do that, what I'm afraid for you is that you'll get out close to the bottom, then the market moves back up, and you say, well, okay, I was wrong this time. I better get back in there and start getting my equities working for me because I can see the fixed income is not going to get me where I need to be. And then what happens to you is that you wait for the market to recover. You jump in with that 50% or whatever in equities just in time for the market to start back down. Folks who end up timing the market in this, what I call the I can't stand it anymore market timing strategy, are in real trouble. Because every time you get that setback, that you lose that, in essence, that possible buying power by losing the future growth of equities, and then going back in at a higher price, that's a killer over time. I think that you have to decide right now I am willing to see my portfolio go down a certain amount. I think that you have, to come to, you have to come to grips with the reality that whatever part you have in equities, that that part is going to go down 50%. And if you can't take that, you need to make a serious adjustment in your asset allocation. That balance between the fixed income and the equity. Number 11, basing distributions on flat returns and flat constant inflation. In other words, setting your plans on assuming that the market will make 10% a year, that inflation will be 3% a year. What I do when I look at the possibilities of, of, of distributions and inflation I look at all many, many periods of high inflation, low inflation, high returns, low returns. Look at many ways that the market could in fact unfold and see if in fact you have the risk tolerance, you have enough money, you have a need for the money that will match this particular uh, production, this either the good times following the bad or the bad times following the good. What happens if you start your investing in 1972? You're retired in 1972. You walk right into 1973, 1974. What if you start in 1999 and you walk right into 2000 through 2002? What if you start in early part of 2007? You walk right into 2008. What if you had a heavy, a heavy position in technology in the late 90s and you walk right in to that bear market of the early 2000s? You see, you have to be able to test that approach. And if you use an assumption that everything is flat, you're going to make 10% a year, you're going to have 3% inflation, that is, in fact, not the way the market works. And you need to have that tested. And to have somebody, if you can't do this yourself, I think you need to talk to an advisor who can take a look at your situation and say, okay, let's assume we don't always have 3%. Let's assume we get a series of events that could be unfriendly. Are you built to last? Number 12, the fear of the loss of principal with bonds or bond funds when all you need is income. I was sitting in a parking lot waiting for my 
wife to come out of the hardware store. She's better of that than I am, hardware. She was, I was sitting in the car and I was, the fellow had his window open at the car next to me and they were just talking on the radio about how the market had just fallen a hundred and some points. And I said to him, uh, probably sorry you heard that, huh? He said, oh, no, no, I'm out of the market. And I said, well, that's good. Congratulations, because you, you didn't lose this money. I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm not well. I've got all my money in CDs and bonds, and I'm not making anything. I can't meet my cost of living, because now I've left the equities market because it's too risky. I've gone into bonds, and I'm not getting enough income. I said, well, why don't you put it into a series of bond funds? Because you, right now, bond funds are paying about 5% if you put together a portfolio of some high grade, some high yield, some short term, some intermediate term. He said, oh, I can't do that. Because if I do that, if interest rates go up, the bonds go down. I said, well, do you need any more than 5%? Would that be enough to actually meet your cost of living? Oh, that'd be great, he said. That'd be plenty. I said, well, if you own bond funds and interest rates go up, yeah, the principal will go down some, but as those bonds buy new bonds to put into the portfolio, because as interest rates go up, lots of new money comes into bond funds, they're going to be buying bond funds that pay more interest. Your 5% is going to go up. 5.1, 5.2, maybe even up to 5.5 or 6 over time. He said, yeah, but I don't want to take the risk. Well, the challenge for a lot of retirees is there is no free lunch. And the problem is, is that you have to take some kind of risk. If you want cash flow and you want fixed income, you may have to take some principal loss in order to have that cash flow. You can't protect against every risk all the time. Number 13. People have a tendency to invest where they have a sense of comfort. And one sense of discomfort for a lot of people is having their money, I'm talking about the equity or stock part of the portfolio, in international securities. And what I suspect they may not know is that by adding international securities to the equity part of their portfolio actually reduces their risk. It doesn't raise their risk, it reduces it because internationals just, they don't go up and down together with the US. Plus sometimes the dollar is in decline and that's good for internationals. Sometimes the dollar's going up, and that's bad for internationals. But what the academics have found is that when you put U.S. and international together, not only do you historically get a better return, but the risk declines. There is an advantage. And on top of that, you may know this, but if you don't, only about 45% of the global corporate public, publicly traded equities, stocks, less than 45% are represented by U.S. companies. The rest are international companies. And some people will say, well, I've got my internationals. I've got Microsoft, and Microsoft sells internationally. I've got GE. GE makes a lot of money internationally. That's true. But in order to have a really productive international portfolio, you need to have the full range of the large growth, like Microsoft and GE, large value, companies that are out of favor, although some may say Microsoft is that themselves, and some small growth, some small value, even a slice of emerging markets. So I hope as you look at your equity part of your portfolio that you will look at adding some internationals. In our portfolios, we have half of the equity in internationals. We have half of the equities in value. And that's unusual because most people will have 
most of their equity in the U.S. in growth. And we have about half of our equity in small cap. So all of these things, they may be a little uncomfortable to add to your portfolio, but if you don't add them, I think you're missing a very fine extra return that will help you in your retirement. Number 14, not focusing on what can be controlled. I talk with people all the time and the, they always want to talk about, well, what do you think about the uh, inflation, Paul? What, what, do you, what, do you, are, what are you doing about that? What about this political situation? I mean, can you find anybody that's honest? And I am scared to death about unemployment and what's going to happen to our kids. I mean, the educational system, the Chinese are beating us. I mean, on and on and on about things that actually they can't, they can't have much control of. And yet they let those thoughts and those concerns start to color how they think about investing, how they decide to do what they do with their money. Well, I will tell them, here's what I think, but it doesn't matter. What an expert says, in a sense, it doesn't matter because we can't do anything about it, and in most cases, they can't either. That's the wrong thing to worry about. Well, I shouldn't say it's the wrong thing to worry about, but it's the wrong thing to focus in terms of control. You can control expenses. You can control diversification. You can control the asset classes you have in your portfolio. You can control the taxes that you pay. And very often, those very people who are so upset about the economy, about politics, about the international situation, about the wars, they haven't taken the time to control the things they can control. And number 15, get rid of unproductive investments. That is very important because what you want to make sure is that everything you do from now on is the right thing. And it is never the right time to do the wrong thing. If you have asset classes in your portfolio that do not have a, a real long-term record of paying a good premium for the risk you're taking, if you have mutual funds that have high expenses, if you have mutual funds that, 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 that have high turnover and are costing you, the sooner you get out of those bad asset classes, those high expenses, the, the, the high turnover, the better off you are. Now you might ask, ask me, what's a bad asset class? Well, let me give you an example of one. The NASDAQ, the technology index, if you will. And what's wrong with it? I mean, obviously it's made up of great companies. But if I look back at the last 40 years, and I look at the return of that technology index, and I look at the risk that it takes to get that return, it's about the same return as the S&P 500 at twice the risk, twice the risk. I don't want an asset class that gives me the same return at twice the, the, uh, the risk. I'm sure, emerging markets are higher risk, than the S&P 500, but you get a much higher return. So I want you to go through and pick out those funds and those asset classes that are costing you money, that aren't moving you forward to more success, more money, and less risk, and of course, peace of mind. Number 16, procrastination, putting things off. For years, I've thought about investing in terms of a, a, a big circle, and it's a pie graph. There are some pieces of pie here that, uh, that I think are important for all of us to be aware of. The one piece of pie in terms of the information about investing we have to know, it represents what you know you know. There's another piece that represents what you know you don't know. And I'd be curious as you think about that. Is your piece that represents what you know you know bigger or smaller than what you know you don't know? Well, I suspect 
The bigger piece is what you don't know you don't know. And the one piece I'd like to know is the future. <laughs> I don't know. I can't know. And then there's a piece that represents what you know you know, but you're wrong. Now, that piece may be much bigger than, uh, th than you, you, you would expect. But the fact is, is that many people believe things. The, tons of the myths of investing that I talk about, they believe those myths, but they're wrong. And then there's what you don't know you don't know. And of course, you have no idea what you don't know you don't know. Could be a little piece, could be a great big piece. But that's one of those things lurking back there in the weeds that come, could jump out to bite you at some point, but you don't even know it's there, which is why I think diversification is such an important thing for you to be doing with your portfolio. But then there's this final piece that I think is so important. It's what you know you know, but you don't do anything about it. You know you should have low expenses, but you sit there with high expenses. You, you, you continue to take the punishment. You know you should be more diversified. You know it, but you don't do it. And I often ponder, how can I get people to do it? And I think the answer is that it probably, for most of you, has to be in baby steps. Maybe you first attack expenses, then you attack, you attack uh, asset classes, then you attack turnover. But somehow you have, to, you have to figure out what you know you know and do something about it. And of course, number 17, taking advice from the wrong source. I have a friend, he's uh, in his 80s now, and many years ago when he retired, a friend of his said, you need to go see, I'll call him Bill. Bill really knows how to help you. So this fellow that I had known for many years, he went over to see Bill. He had a million two in his uh, portfolio to retire on, and he planned to use a part of that every year to live on. Well, this person that my friend went to see convinced him that what he needed was a variable annuity. And so he spent two hours, two hours, and sold my friend a variable annuity that my friend was told he was guaranteed to get his money back. And if it didn't go up when he died, he would eventually, his heirs would get all that money, wouldn't lose a penny. Well, in the meantime, he happened to do that right about the time that the tech bubble was still going up. It hadn't, it hadn't rolled over to play dead yet. And he convinced him, look, since you're guaranteed to have a great return, why not put it into these high-tech stock funds? Well, of course, then the market turned over. And after he got into those variable annuities that were guaranteed that he wouldn't lose any money, it went down to about $600,000. By the way, not as bad as some people did in that huge decline. Now, what's the cost of what happened to my friend? Well, for about two hours' work, he lost $600,000. So at some level, you could say that it cost him $200,000 an hour for what he heard and what he did. The other side of the coin is the person who sold him this variable annuity after two hours of careful consideration of what's in his best interest, ah, the client's best interest, he made about $60,000 commission, two hours, $60,000. Uh, not bad, or maybe I should say not good. Because what's happened is this million two that was going to give this retiree income for him to enjoy life, he's the kind of a person who isn't going to get out of that until he breaks even. 
He has not used any of that money to live on because he, want to make, he wants to make doggone sure that his kids at least get the million too. And so, in a sense, he's been robbed of a lot of enjoyment. Oh, and he's proud. He's proud his kids are going to get a million too. But he really could have been enjoying that money. Listening to the wrong people. Getting the wrong advice. So please, as best you can, keep the commissions out of the process. They are the steroids of the investment business. They are the drug of choice. And you've got to be careful that you protect yourself against those people who sound so caring, so right, with a great, a great sales pitch about how can't lose. You can't lose. This is guaranteed. Well, it's the wrong guarantee. Number 18, giving up liquidity. I think this is one of the biggest mistakes we can make. I believe this of a young person too. But when we get into retirement, this can be a killer. I claim you should never give up one day liquidity. Never put your money anywhere where you can't get it back out when you want it. And you can get it out when you want it without any kind of a penalty. Because if you end up in an illiquid product that, that you can't get out of, and you're stuck in it for the rest of your life, well, what do you do if you need that to live on? So please, do not invest in illiquid products. In fact, most of the, of the products that I've seen over the years that people will guarantee but you lose liquidity, if you simply had a portfolio, 40% in equities, 60% in fixed income, it would accomplish everything I've ever seen in those guaranteed products and maintain one day liquidity. Now the one exception where I will say, okay, illiquidity is all right. And that's when you have less money than you need. And you have to invest in an annuity in order to create enough income for the rest of your life, that it's worth giving up that liquidity in exchange for a lifetime of cash flow. Knowing that if you only live for one week, the insurance company gets to keep all the money. But in exchange for that, they promise you cash flow for the rest of your life. Number 19, giving away too much. I know this is a challenge for people who are charitable, people who are caring about their children, certainly don't want to see their children struggle. But giving away too much really is the same thing as spending too much. I've met so many people who are in this position where they feel they have no choice but to give to their children, give to their church. I once met a couple in North Carolina who had worked very hard, made a lot of money, the husband and wife did, and they gave over 20% a year. And they created expectations within the charitable community where they lived. So when they quit working, all of a sudden they had very little money compared to what they had before. And yet they felt great pressure from the people that, that, that they had been supporting because they came back and actually acted as if they were mad at them, that they weren't giving as much, and they felt guilty. And I said, look, get rid of the guilt immediately. Tell them you'll give it to them. Promise you'll give it to them. When you die, if you have any money left over, when you die, then you'll give it to them. But a lot of people allow their kids to extract more than they can really afford. I have a client, uh, other than managing the money uh, relatively efficiently, I think the best thing I have done for this client is every time her kids come to her for money, she says, you'll have to talk to Paul because Paul will tell you whether or not I can afford to give away that money. And I think one of the problems is 
that they see the amount of money that their mother has to be a lot. I see for somebody who might spend many years expensively in nursing homes that what she has is too little. And that is something. If you can figure out some way to protect yourself from kids who, if they think you've got too much, are more than happy to have you share it with them. But it can cost you. And I know a lot of folks who, who, who get to retirement, and the reason, and by the way, I'm not being critical. I understand this. The reason they don't have more money and a reasonable amount of money to retire on is because they did too many things for their kids. Now this sounds kind of harsh possibly, but I think you need to be careful that you leave yourself enough for the future. I've always felt that the worst thing that could ever happen would be to end up at the end of your life out of money, turning to children who don't have much and in a sense asking for help because you gave it away and then they can't in some sense give it back I'm not sure that's going to be good for your kids. So I've always been pretty sensitive when I look at somebody's plan. Are you giving away the right amount? And number 20, not spending enough. And boy, do I understand this problem. I am frugal. I have a very difficult time spending money on myself. And in almost every couple, including my wife and myself, there's a spender and there's a saver. I may have just given away who the spender is, I think. And that is an interesting kind of a, of a, of a battle because the spender legitimately says, what's going on here? I mean, what's this money for? Isn't it to have fun? Isn't it to do things that are, that? Not, yeah, sure, they cost little money, but it's an experience. Loosen up. And the saver says, oh, now, wait a minute. Uh, you know, we may need this later in life. This, and, and so you get into this defensive mode. And I think very often, having counseled a lot of the saver-spender uh, couples, the saver, when they see the spender start spending, they're not sure when it's going to stop. It looks like it's out of control. And of course, the spender thinks, my God, when will the saver ever start? So these are legitimate positions. I think both the spender and the saver, uh, they're, they're, they are right. It's just it's where they come from. And one of the things I've tried to get people to do, if they have enough money, is to set up what I call a flexible plan, a plan that allows you to take out a certain amount of money. Let's just call it 5% for a second. Allows you to take out 5%. If the market goes up, you take out 5% of that higher number. If the market goes down, you take out 5% of that lower number. Now let's think about that for just a second. The market's going up, and it goes up two out of three years, and the spender gets a raise. The spender gets to be rewarded for the fact that the market goes up. And the saver says, okay, but we got a deal, remember? Because when the market goes down, now you take 5% out of a lower number. In other words, there's a self-adjusting saver-spender argument here that gives the saver what they want, protection on the downside, and the spender what they want, a chance to participate on the upside. Well, I hope this seems like a... A, a, a reasonable list of important things to review in your own situation. And, and I want you to remember my commitment to those of you who are the PBS contributors, who have made my, given me the opportunity, in essence, to be here on PBS and to share this information. And in exchange, I want to make sure that you get what, you're, what, what, what you want here. I want you to feel free. If you get to a point where, where you are just absolutely stuck, I want you to email me, paul at merriman.com, and I will respond and try to help you through that moment of stuckness because I want you to be a successful investor. I want you to make more money. I want you to take less risk. 
and I want you to have peace of mind, and I hope this information will lead you to a point where you will have that ultimate peace of mind with you and your life and your money. Thank you, thank you very much.